Where should I begin? I think it's best to start from the very start, but first, I want to express my gratitude to all the people here for their support. I want to thank everyone, whether you're going through a tough time, have caused pain, or have taken time to help others like me. I've been quietly observing this community for a while because I couldn't find the right words to express my pain. To be honest, I still struggle to do so. It's a weakness of mine, I suppose. Three months ago, my life was quite good, or at least that's what I believed. I've been married to my wife for a decade since we were both 22 years old. We tied the knot shortly after I graduated from college. She used to work as a waitress, and we started dating while I was still in college. I pursued a career in law enforcement and quickly moved up the ranks, eventually requiring me to travel a few times each year for my job. We were just starting to plan for our first child. My wife had her own pursuits, mainly taking care of our home, working a few days as a waitress, and enjoying various arts and crafts hobbies on the side. She had a creative spirit and was always engaged in artistic activities. I was always supportive of her interests and didn't worry about whether she had a full-time, regular job. It felt like she was deeply in love with me, and I was certainly in love with her too. Otherwise, we wouldn't have decided it was time to start a family. On September 19, 2016, I left for a conference on the West Coast. I gave my wife a goodbye kiss and reminded her I'd be back on the morning of the 24th, planning to stay overnight on Friday because of events lasting until the early evening. Then, on Wednesday the 21st, I learned that the main reason for my conference attendance, a couple of important talks by a respected expert in the field, got cancelled due to illness. I thought about calling my wife to let her know I'd be back early, but I changed my mind. I decided to surprise her with flowers and a gift instead. So, I flew back on Thursday the 22nd. I went to a jewellery store and the florist, and I called a restaurant she liked to make a reservation. Afterward, I headed home. When I arrived at our house, I noticed a familiar car parked on the street. It was the car of the young man who looked after our pool, so I didn't pay it much mind. I went in through the side door and stepped inside our home. Right away, I sensed something was off. I heard a commotion from the other side of the house. In my head, I thought, the side door was unlocked, I can hear my wife making noises from the bedroom area, and there's a lot of movement in there. I quietly took my service pistol from my holster and made my way toward the open bedroom door. I'm not sure how far to go with this, but I suppose that a mod can clean things up if I do go too far. As I rounded into the bedroom through the door, I heard my wife shout, F my ass, you effing bastard, and witnessed the pool boy mounting her from behind, with them both facing the wall at the head of the bed. Time slowed down, and I realized that this was no assault taking place, but that this was all consensual. I had my pistol raised, but thankfully I managed to lower it. I then walked back towards the side door and left the house. I called a fellow law enforcement officer, Elio, to come pick me up because I wasn't in a state to drive. Despite all the tough situations I've been in during my career, this was different. It left me incredibly shaken. When I first entered the house and heard the commotion, I left the flowers on the table and had my gun drawn. I did this to avoid alerting my wife to my presence. For over an hour, I didn't contact my wife. My colleague at the department helped me, telling her he didn't know exactly where I was, but assured her that I was physically fine and would talk to her when I was ready. All I know about those days is that she tried reaching out to everyone she knew, getting more and more worried as time went on. On the 26th, I emailed my wife. I let her know that I had left the flowers for her, that I was filing for divorce, and that she should expect an officer to come to our house to collect department property, like firearms and my personal belongings, such as clothing. I ignored her replies. I also had the department change my phone number because her calls and texts were becoming overwhelming, and I needed to stay firm in my decision. 
I made sure everyone who needed my new number was informed. Interestingly, I had a month of paid leave that we had planned to use in December for a vacation to start a family. Plans were made and then broken, so the department allowed me to take that leave immediately. I left town for a month to get away from everyone and spend some time alone. I found this community while on a remote beach. I want to let you all know that the sadness, anger and fear that you've experienced, both now and in the past, served a purpose you didn't know about. You are my source of strength. Even though I may have appeared strong on the outside, deep down, I'm not completely strong. Many thoughts have crossed my mind since that moment in the bedroom doorway. These thoughts ranged from a sudden surge of anger and the urge to do something terrible, to profound sadness and hours spent examining myself, accompanied by feelings of guilt. My wife was not the same person I saw in that bedroom with the young pool boy engaging in such a disturbing act. It was a behavior we never explored ourselves, and it was something I had no idea she was interested in. I questioned if I failed to meet her needs. She never explicitly asked for such a thing, nor did she drop hints even though she was quite open about suggesting new things. Frankly, I never even considered doing something like that to her. I don't know if I could. We had our share of fun activities, but this one didn't seem fun to me. I suppose I won't ever have to grapple with that hidden desire of hers. I haven't directly spoken to my wife during this entire time, except through that one email. A couple we both know, who are friends with us, keep in touch with both of us. My wife has a lot to say, but I have very little to share. I've initiated the divorce process, but I'm holding off on serving the papers until I've thought through every detail. By that, I don't mean I'm considering reconciling, but I want to be prepared for any possible consequences. I dislike surprises and try to minimize any unintended effects. Plans are in motion to handle the distribution of our property through the mutual friends I mentioned earlier, and that's the only topic I'm willing to discuss. She can keep the house since she chose it, and I have no intention of setting foot in it again. I can't erase that image from my mind. The main reason I reached out here is because, even though you don't know me personally, you've been like distant friends, and I'm sure many others like me have leaned on all of you for support, even though you may not be aware of it. Bless all of you. I want to express my gratitude to everyone for your advice and support. As for my W.S. wayward spouse, I can't say for sure if she's truly sorry. I've had no direct contact with her, except through intermediaries, so I can't judge her remorse. As I've learned here, there's a significant difference between genuine remorse for one's actions and remorse for getting caught. I did receive some text messages, emails and voicemails from my W.S., and mutual friends and acquaintances reached out on her behalf. To be honest, I didn't bother to read or listen to them. Actually witnessing her in the act affected me in a different way than if I hadn't seen it. There's nothing abstract about it. There's nothing left to the imagination. Moreover, it felt like I had stumbled upon two wild animals, which made me extremely defensive. I don't really want to hear her voice. I don't want to know her side of the story, at least not right now. I assume it would be a bunch of excuses, and even if there was remorse, could I ever get past what's burned into my memory? Every time I felt the urge to react emotionally, to call her back or respond to a text, I reminded myself that those who get into the most trouble are the ones who don't exercise their right to remain silent. So, when I wanted to react emotionally, I chose to keep quiet instead. I'm fine with taking my time with everything. I'm not trying to postpone the inevitable, though. I am definitely careful about not getting caught up in unproductive thoughts. I must admit, I've had some extensive moments of self-reflection and replaying past events. However, I haven't fallen into the trap of constantly wondering, what did I do to make this happen? Well, at least not more than a couple of times early on. I can't claim to have been a perfect husband, but I believe I put in effort not to take my W.S. for granted. 
Here's something I've recently realized. I sometimes feel like not talking to my WS is a way of punishing her. Is that a healthy approach? It's one of my major concerns. I really don't want to be manipulative. I believe people should act as they truly feel and not try to manipulate others by being insincere. I'm in touch with the department counselor a couple of times a week. It's actually required when we're involved in certain events for obvious reasons. We have a great team. They've mentioned that there will come a time when I'll want answers to questions for the sake of finding closure, and they're guiding me in that direction. Currently, most of my comfort comes from my colleagues at the department and the invaluable knowledge and support I've found here. I sometimes feel like it was unfair to all of you that I waited so long to post. It might give the impression that I'm stronger than I truly am, but that's not the case. Regarding my pension, thank you for the advice. I've already been in touch with the right people to ensure my protection. Right now, I'm feeling quite cautious. In response to a reader's comment, I couldn't help but chuckle when I read this. When I take a step back and view my situation objectively, my marriage suddenly resembles the plot of an adult movie. The pool boy. Seriously, I completely understand why so many people here felt blindsided. We went on with our lives, many of us never imagining that the person we loved deeply, the person we were unwaveringly loyal to, wasn't on the same page with us. I wish I didn't have to witness everything and could have found undeniable evidence instead. It's akin to witnessing a murder rather than having to prove everything afterward. Right now, I find it challenging to justify wanting any answers at all. It's comparable to dealing with a death. People often want to know why someone passed away at a young age or in a tragic manner, but if they knew the reasons, would it truly make a difference? I'm still in a stage where I'd like to find something positive in the answers I might receive. I can't quite imagine that happening. Emotions can be very unpredictable. I was standing by the window, looking towards downtown and thinking about my father. He was like Mr. Spock, not very emotional. If I scored a touchdown or made the honor roll, that was expected. If I misbehaved terribly, the most he'd show was disappointment. He'd ask things like, what's the logical outcome of your actions? What are the unintended consequences? What purpose would getting angry serve? He was the child of an alcoholic, and many of them tend to develop similar characteristics. They build up layers of emotional defenses against the world. I feel like he did. A reader shares their own experience. Hey, original poster, each case is unique, but we share a lot in common. I also worked in law enforcement and walked in on them having sex. I left the apartment, finished the remaining four hours of my shift, and then went to my brother's place to sleep. Despite staying extremely composed and focused from the moment I realized what I was about to witness, I must admit that I sat in my car for a few minutes with my gun in hand, wondering about things I shouldn't have. Thankfully, I dismissed those thoughts. Back then, almost 30 years ago, the idea of department counselors and PTSD was unheard of. I was fortunate to have my colleagues support me and I had an experienced senior lieutenant who took me aside the following Monday. He told me he was putting me on desk duty for a couple of weeks and asked for my service pistol. I got it back a week later and was back in the field. For me, work became therapeutic. I could zone out and focus on my tasks, and during those 8-12 hours, I wouldn't think about her. I also made the decision that this marked the end of the relationship. She attempted to talk to me, offering various reasons and justifications for what happened and why it shouldn't affect us. I made it very clear that I wanted to end things, and I never changed my mind. I'll come back later if you're still here, but my final piece of advice is to recommend engaging in physical activities that make you physically tired. It can help you zone out, sleep better, and generally feel more at ease. My ultimate advice is to use whatever resources your department provides. 
I suffered from PTSD directly related to what I witnessed, along with other experiences in the police force. I carried that burden into my current marriage, where it had no place at all. And now, for real this time, my final piece of advice concerning divorce and splitting assets. I understand you don't want the house, but make sure you're getting some equity from it. A 50-50 division of assets doesn't mean you get one car while she gets the other. It means you each get about half the value of the assets accumulated during the marriage. If she may have a claim on your pension, then maybe you could consider giving up your share of the house if she, in turn, forgoes any claim to your pension. The original poster comments, The similarities are truly astonishing, especially hearing noises when entering the home, approaching the scene cautiously without drawing attention, witnessing the event with your own eyes, retreating from the situation without reacting impulsively, feeling an immediate emotional disconnection or a strange calmness, having no desire to ever return to that place, arranging for someone else to collect your belongings, both of us having about a decade of experience in our careers, feeling completely blindsided, which is unusual for those of us trained to notice verbal and nonverbal cues. How did we miss all of that? You know, I never really thought about hurting myself. I'm not sure if that's unusual or not. In the future, I may need to rely on you for support, if you're open to that. While many experience betrayal, it's rare to find a mentor who has gone through the same experience. I don't believe everything is completely settled in my mind just yet. There's still much work to be done. To everyone who mentioned the home, thank you. My fellow law enforcement officers have been more focused on my emotional well-being than practical matters. I might have acted impulsively regarding that. Edit. I'm looking at the time and date of the post. I don't usually attribute everything to a higher power, but I can't help but believe that everything happens for a reason, and your experience and the timing of your post mean so much to me. It's remarkable. Reader comment. Is it? Or is it your way of maintaining your sanity and self-worth? The original poster responds. I'm not concerned about my sanity, at least not at this point. But when it comes to self-worth, yes, I've been fixated on the seemingly insignificant fact that she chose the pool boy of all people. I can't wrap my head around that. People are telling me that the who doesn't really matter, but the young man who cleaned our pool, really? There might have been others, I guess. I'm not ready to explore that yet. My wife took excellent care of herself. She didn't work out like a bodybuilder, but she exorcists daily. She always wanted to make sure she didn't go too far, as she put it, and wanted to have a little, very little, fat on herself. She said that having more than what she did would make her feel less feminine. From the moment she woke up in the morning, she dressed well, even adding a touch of perfume to complete her appearance. I used to joke that the Queen of England could show up at the door unexpectedly at 8 a.m., and she'd be ready to entertain. I used the term pool boy in a somewhat mocking way. I would have never referred to him like that to anyone before. However, he was the complete opposite of my wife, often untidy and sweaty, and sometimes he showed up smelling like the bar he visited the night before. Yes. My thoughts have ventured to a place where I wondered why she chose someone like him. I always end up with the thought that only she knows why. Maybe that's a question I'll ask if I decide to ask any questions at all. To those who have said that I seem composed or have it all together, thank you. Unfortunately, I don't. That's why I'm here. Being my father's son, I learned to suppress my emotions and keep things buried deep inside, so deep that he didn't even understand himself very well. That, coupled with the fact that I waited so long to post here, might give people the wrong impression about who I am. Like I mentioned earlier, if I were in a good place, I wouldn't be here. I'm grateful to everyone for their support. There are so many people here in pain, yet they pour their hearts into helping people they don't even know. It's truly remarkable. When I eventually overcome all of this, and I will, 
I'll find a way to repay the kindness that has been given to me. The plot thickens. My mother plays a unique role in this situation. She's like a mother to my WW, not in a physical or genetic sense, of course. My WW lost her mother during high school, and my mother filled that void. My WW called my mother this morning and revealed that she's been contemplating self-deletion for a while now. My mother talked to her to ensure that my WW wasn't immediately threatening self-deletion, and as soon as they hung up, my mother contacted the sheriff's department. I don't work for the sheriff, by the way. They sent a deputy to the house, who picked her up and took her to a local hospital for an evaluation. That's where my WW is now. My mother then called me to update me on the situation. Acting out and threatening self-deletion is often a manipulative tactic, but it must be taken seriously. I know where my WW is, and I trust the professionals who are evaluating her, because I've worked with them many times in the past. However, I'm unsure about how to respond. Initially, I felt the urge to rush over there, with my eyes on her, and see her for myself, even though I've been avoiding direct contact with her. Currently, I'm holding my ground and waiting for the results of the evaluation. She's in capable hands, and I'll be informed of her condition after the assessment. I'm certainly as hurt as anyone who has been betrayed by someone they had complete trust in. I don't want her to die because of this. It's frustrating when people use the I'll kill myself card because most of the time it's a bluff. However, calling that bluff can have serious consequences. Has anyone experienced a situation like this before? I've always been on the outside looking in during such incidents, as it was my job. This time, I'm dealing with it voluntarily, I suppose. A reader responds, I've been reading your posts and following your story, but I haven't had much to contribute until now. You and your mother handled the situation exactly how it should have been handled. You should continue to hold the line. If you go and see her now, it will only reinforce that if she threatens to hurt herself or actually does, it will bring you to her. I learned this the hard way. Unfortunately, I have too much experience with self-deletion. My brother deleted himself. I had thoughts of deleting myself from my early teens through my early twenties. My mother attempted to delete herself twice. My stepmother has used threats of self-deletion as a manipulation tactic several times. My mother comes from a family with a history of mental illness, personality disorders, self-deletion, and, of course, affairs. I've been in individual counseling for three years, and dealing with situations involving threats of self-deletion has been a topic I've worked on. Due to my past experiences, I'm easily vulnerable and manipulated by self-deletion threats. The plan I have in place going forward is to remove myself from the situation and call 911. Let the professionals evaluate the situation. You and your mother did exactly that. Of course, you're concerned for her. How could you not be? You're not a robot. However, she needs to understand that such actions will only push people away not bring them closer. It's best to maintain no contact for now. Perhaps someday, when the timing is right for you, you can initiate contact with her. But now is definitely not the right time. The original poster responds, I'm sorry to hear about the challenges you've faced in your life. I appreciate you sharing your experiences with me and everyone here. I'll be cautious in how I handle this new development. At this point, there's not enough information for me to react. A reader comments, It's probably best to maintain no contact, but I'd be tempted to tell her, Why are you contemplating self-deletion? You already have a boyfriend that you apparently like a lot. I mean, really, what did she expect? What kind of person does this and then expects their spouse to want to be with them? Yeah, yeah, she didn't expect to get caught. So what? She still made these decisions. I understand why you don't want to listen to her. She might either say she made a mistake or find a way to blame you, like you were distant, blah, blah, or the latest excuse of the day, he was so persistent. 
Why would you want to hear any of it? But then again, she was your wife for a number of years. How could you not eventually want to see her and hear what she has to say for herself? I mean, is she still in contact with the pool boy? I really have no advice for you. I think you're doing the right thing. The original poster shares. I have no idea if she's been in contact with the OP. I assume she might have, but it doesn't mean much to me right now because I don't intend to get back together with her. In fact, now that you've mentioned it, I've deliberately blocked the I wonder what she's doing train of thought until now. Yeah, I don't think I want to go there. It's an unpleasant thought. Mutual contacts know not to share her drama with me, and those who persisted eventually got the message stop. My mother felt that this incident went beyond drama and called me after she handled the situation herself. Hello, everyone. I've read all of the posts and I'd like to address them all, but it's very hectic around here. Most of it may not matter all that much anyway. My wife was held over the weekend for testing and observation. I spoke with her early this morning for around 30 minutes with my mother and a psychiatrist present. Her physician came and went, but the psychiatrist and my mother stayed for the 30-minute session. The OM that I witnessed her with was not the only one. She remembers two others in the last six months. Remembers. Along the lines of her infidelity, that's about as far as we got in such a short amount of time. It appears that my wife may have one or more medical issues affecting her behavior. I spent 30 minutes with her, but over an hour with her physician and psychiatrist. They asked me numerous questions about her habits and behaviors. During the session, some odd behaviors she displayed in recent times came up while I was being questioned. At the time, these behaviors didn't have a significant impact on me, but my responses seemed to provide the doctors with valuable insights. They also explained that my wife might not always be in complete control of her behavior, and we will learn more about the situation in the next week or so. They emphasized that they were speaking in general terms because they were not entirely sure about the nature of the issue. They have scheduled a series of tests for early tomorrow morning to follow up on the ones conducted over the weekend. These tests include an MRI of her brain as the neurological examination they performed after the initial interview raised more questions. They also discovered a dark spot in her brain when they injected dye during an angiogram, and dark spots can sometimes indicate tumors. After my meeting with the doctors, my mother and I had a discussion. She mentioned that I have a responsibility to support my wife if her actions are indeed a result of medical problems. I'm uncertain about how to feel, but I won't abandon her if she's ill. Have you ever been in a situation where you have so many emotions that you can't separate them individually? That's where I am right now. What a complicated situation. I'll make an effort to respond to everyone soon. I appreciate your support. I haven't had enough time with the doctors to discuss my numerous questions, and they haven't had sufficient time to reach any conclusive diagnosis, if there's even something to diagnose. I expect that things may become clearer in the next week or so. In response to a reader's comment, no. There is almost no medical condition that so overwhelmingly impairs a person's ability to choose to engage in a sexual affair that they cannot control it. If she truly had one of those psychological conditions that prevent personal choice, it would profoundly impact every aspect of her life, and she would be the subject of medical studies and papers due to the extremely rare nature of such conditions. You work in law enforcement, and you know how rarely the insanity defense actually succeeds, right? The answer is almost never. If she was capable of planning these encounters around your schedule when she thought she could get away with it, then she had the presence of mind to know she shouldn't have been doing it. Do not let her off the hook using an insanity defense with you. It's a disregard for your intelligence and a disservice to the very few individuals who truly suffer from severe mental illness. If she could plan, hide, and lie about it, she had the capacity to choose. 
She may indeed have a mental illness or even a medical issue, but it didn't make her cheat on you multiple times. It didn't make her lie to you and hide it from you. Keep the no contact rule and continue with the separation. Original poster. One would think that her behavior would be strange all of the time, or at least often enough for me to observe suspect behaviors at times, if it were unintentional. Her already healthy libido had become quite more pronounced over the last year or so, but what man is going to suspect his wife when she wants more time in the sack with him? Even so, I can't remember a time when I turned her down. So many questions, yet so few answers at this point. Medically speaking, my wife is fine as well. I won't go into all the details, but after extensive testing and going through her medical records, the dark spot they found in her brain is most likely from a cheerleading accident during high school. It's almost certainly not the cause of her behavior. The experts work with probabilities, and they indicated that it was extremely unlikely that the spot they found had any effect on her personality. When presented with these facts, my wife gave up on all pretenses and opened up to me. What a week it's been. I'm utterly drained. We had a conversation yesterday evening, and it was heart-wrenching. She cried most of the time, and I was just numb. She confessed to being unfaithful seven times over the last eight months, with three different men, all casual encounters. The pool boy was a one-time event, which I witnessed. The other two men were an HVAC technician who came by for our yearly maintenance, and a person she met at a gas station. The pool guy and the gas station guy were isolated incidents. She doesn't even know who the gas station guy is. There were five encounters with the HVAC guy, who is married. I will be contacting his wife soon. My soon-to-be ex-wife, STBXW, is unaware of this, of course, and I doubt she cares. It appears that she didn't have an emotional connection with any of them. She said she wanted to be intimate with men who would treat her in a dirty way, believing I wasn't the type to degrade her as she desired, and these are her actual words. She's accurate about that. Although she was willing to provide explicit details, I declined because the memory of what I witnessed was distressing enough. I explained that I was open to role-playing but had boundaries regarding certain behaviors I wouldn't participate in. She correctly assumed that I wouldn't fulfill her desires in those ways. It's important to note that I don't judge those who engage in unconventional acts in their marriages. I believe some marriages thrive on unconventional activities. However, she never communicated her desires to me. I think she genuinely feels remorseful, but I've come to realize she's not the right match for me anymore. I believe she recognizes that I can't meet some of her needs, and if those needs are essential to her happiness and led her to be unfaithful, then she should find someone who can fulfill her desires. Essentially, I told her it's best for both of us to move on, and after some negotiation, she reluctantly agreed. While she claims to have used protection during each encounter, and the incident I witnessed supports her claim in that case, we've both been tested for STDs. The initial tests show negative results for any infections, but I'm still awaiting results from a couple of additional tests. I acknowledge that I should have gotten tested months ago, and it was a significant oversight on my part. We had many discussions, but I'll refrain from writing a lengthy post. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I feel indebted to everyone here for helping me through this challenging time. We've decided to proceed with an uncontested divorce. And just for fun, I'll add that I'm planning to take on the pool boy, the heating and air guy, and the gas station dude after the divorce. Joke, I have no intentions of doing anything of the sort. I'm heartbroken, but all I can do now is find humor, love those who support me, and spend time with my law enforcement family and the wonderful people here who have been by my side. God bless all of you. Reader. Comment. I'm glad you're finding some closure in all of this. Can you share some information about what your wife was doing during the period when you had no contact with her? 
Did she make an effort to improve herself? Did she take any actions to show remorse or regret? If it's too difficult to answer, I understand. Original poster. These are excellent questions. I don't have complete information about what she was doing during that time. For all I know, she could have been having men over to our house, although I highly doubt it, considering my extensive network of law enforcement colleagues, some of whom frequent that neighborhood. I do know that she spent a lot of time with my mother, went to the gym daily, verified by witnesses who saw her there during their workouts, and spent time with a few couples who are our friends. Other than that, I didn't intentionally track her activities, so I can't provide more details. First and foremost, I want to make it clear that I'm not interested in reconciliation. That was never an option for me, especially after I witnessed the act of infidelity, which I found deeply abhorrent. If I hadn't witnessed it, and if it hadn't been so repulsive to me, I might have considered the possibility of reconciliation, but I can't say for sure. So, my questions were quite limited. What my soon-to-be ex-wife offered was everything I had asked for, and more. She openly admitted to her infidelity with multiple people and took full responsibility. As far as I know, she disclosed all the incidents and was willing to discuss the details of each encounter with me. Whether she withheld anything else is of no consequence to me, because I no longer see her as the woman I once loved. That person is gone, and there's no need for further examination. Importantly, she didn't place the blame on me. She acknowledged that I wasn't meeting her sexual needs, but she owned up to her part in it and expressed remorse, apologizing repeatedly. She has started individual counseling, I see, to understand herself, her motivations, and whether her actions were related to any psychological issues or simply personal choices. I understand that many people might suggest various measures like a verification after cheating, they see, polygraph tests, no contact demands, and so on. However, those measures don't apply here because I've already moved on emotionally. I didn't need to verify her current actions or whereabouts. I mainly wanted to have a candid conversation with her, hoping to part ways amicably. I don't want to have any more association with this new person than necessary because she reminds me of the old person, and that just makes me miserable. It's like I was married to a woman. She's gone, and now I have to deal with her troubled twin regularly. That's how I see it. I don't wish for her to be unhappy, but I also don't want to be unhappy while trying to fix something that's irreparably broken. The vivid image of what I witnessed keeps flashing in my mind every time I imagine us being together again, attempting to mend things. I don't feel the urge to dig deeper into anything. It's over. What I'm doing isn't coming from a cold or calculated place. It's not born out of strength or an iron will. It's driven by a sense of revulsion and disgust. I want to ensure that she's safe and in the best possible health under the circumstances. I have people in place to take care of that without me having direct involvement. Beyond that, I'm moving forward. I was advised not to post on message boards or social media until a few things were settled. Those matters have been sorted out, and now I'm in the waiting period for the legal process. In light of this, my soon-to-be ex-wife and I are officially separated. We need to wait one year before the divorce becomes final. There's absolutely no chance of reconciliation. I need to be true to myself, and I recognize that I can forgive her for her actions, but I can never forget. It wouldn't be fair to either of us to put in the effort for reconciliation when my heart and mind will never fully heal from this. She is currently taking antidepressants and attending counseling sessions as mandated by the court. Furthermore, I've rented her an apartment that's about 35 miles away from our once happy home. I've kept the house for myself, and this distance is intentional as I want to avoid running into her in our town. I'm also providing her with financial support until she can secure a better job. There's a predetermined time limit on these allowances and rental payments, and once the divorce is finalized, 
the court's decree will take precedence, regardless of any ongoing support. She still remains on my health insurance policy, and she's a partial beneficiary on my life insurance policies until the divorce is officially finalized. I sometimes vacillate between being irritated that I'm supporting her after her actions and feeling a sense of misplaced honor where I believe it's my duty to help her get back on her feet. I've made it clear to her that I have no desire to communicate with her unless there are financial or health issues that necessitate my assistance. This boundary has been respected and any indirect communication has gone through my mother, who, as I mentioned earlier, has a maternal role in her life as well. I don't feel it's right to dictate the terms of their relationship. She's going through a difficult time and I can't help but feel some sympathy for her. I'm hurting too. She caused the hurt, and just because you love someone doesn't mean they're exempt from the consequences of such a betrayal. Ending a relationship doesn't erase the love. It's a tragic situation, but life continues. I'm not entirely sure what to add, but I want to emphasize that I'm here to respond to any questions. I consider this community an essential part of my healing process, and I also have a desire to pay it forward to help others going through similar experiences. I have great admiration and respect for all of you. Regarding future romantic relationships, I am aware that I may encounter trust issues. Infidelity has a lasting impact. Before I even think about starting a new relationship, I'm focusing on finalizing the divorce, as being separated is not the same. Furthermore, I understand the importance of working on myself before seeking out a new connection. It wouldn't be fair to me or to them. I am actively seeking counseling to have an external perspective on my situation. Between my friends, family and counselors, I believe and hope that I have that aspect covered. As for my STBXW, she made threats to self-delete herself, leading to her being taken into custody. Depending on the findings of the attending physician and psychologist, they may report to a judge who can then order treatment for the underlying issues. Since her medical condition wasn't deemed the sole cause of her depression and her threats were taken seriously, the judge mandated six months of counseling and a follow-up report. As we are legally separated, I have no right to know the details that don't directly involve me. I haven't had direct contact with any of my wife's affair partners, at least not that I'm aware of. I dread the possibility of such an encounter. However, in my professional capacity, I have my professional restraint to protect me from questionable behavior. I've imagined the scenarios many times, but I always remind myself that it's our wayward spouses who are the issue. Without their wandering, there would be no affair partners. We each have our ways of handling the situation, but I believe we share similar feelings deep down. It's how we choose to express those feelings that varies. Hang in there. I don't know what I would have done without everyone here. Even in the future, I'm sure we'll work through our pain together, and after some time, we'll be paying it forward to help others.